Wind can have a massive effect on your aircraft when trying to navigate between two points. Knowing the wind is therefore an important part of flight planning, but I didn't look up the wind forecast today. Can we figure out the wind at 2000 feet here using basic VOR navigation without using the GPS or any external information? Let's find out. Firstly, as with any navigation, I'm going to select two fixed points on the ground to fly between. I've chosen Treasure VOR and Melbourne VOR. The ground track between these points is 343 degrees true. We'll be tracking 350 degrees magnetic across the ground, as the magnetic variation in the area is 7 degrees to the west. The distance between these two VORs is 26.7 nautical miles. This will become useful later. If there's any wind from the side however, the aircraft will drift off track, unless we turn the aircraft into wind. The stronger the wind, the more into wind we have to steer. In the aircraft here, I have Treasure VOR tuned in, and we're about to pass overhead the station. In standby I have the Melbourne VOR ready to go. I have real world weather on, and I genuinely have no idea where the wind is coming from in Florida today, so I could massively embarrass myself. Here on the OBS I have the ground track that I want to follow between the two VORs, which is 350 degrees. In addition to the effect that the wind will be having on our lateral path, if the wind's coming from ahead or behind us, it will also speed us up or slow us down in relation to the ground. In order to calculate the wind direction and speed, we therefore need to know the extent of both of these effects, but we're not going to use the GPS, so we have to go old school. Which is why you're here and not on the Corporate Pilot Dad channel right now. It's nice to see all three of you here by the way. We know that we've crossed the VOR when this to flag here disappears and switches to a from flag. As we cross the treasure VOR, I'm starting the timer on the aircraft. This will enable me to ascertain the amount of time it takes to travel between the two VORs, and then compare it to the distance between them, that we already know is 26.7 nautical miles. So we've passed Treasure VOR and now we're on the way. I'm going to switch from Treasure VOR to Melbourne VOR, maintaining the 350 degrees magnetic ground track, and we can start to take some information for our calculations. We know that the magnetic track over the ground is 350 degrees. If the wind was zero, the heading would match this. We can see however that the heading is not quite 350. We're showing around 345 degrees on the direction indicator. As we need to be fairly accurate here, let's cross check that with the compass to make sure they're both in alignment. That looks like about 345 as well. So we now know that we're having to make a 5 degree correction to the left. That means the wind is coming from the left, although we can't tell the exact direction and speed from this alone. If only it was that easy. We need to establish our true airspeed which will come in handy later. To do this, we'll take the temperature displayed here, and use the airspeed indicator true airspeed scale. We need to set the pressure altitude on this scale, which is 2000 feet, to the current temperature of 26 degrees celsius. We can then read the true airspeed on this scale on the bottom. It's quite turbulent today, and Microsoft Flight Simulator is showing some wild, unrealistic speed swings here, so I'll take a sensible average later. This will also give me a great excuse if I completely screw this up. We are now approaching Melbourne VOR. I have increased the playback rate of the video in some places, but the timer is running in real time in the simulator, so it's still showing an accurate flight time. We're crossing the VOR now, and we can see that the time taken to travel the 26.7 miles between the stations is 14 minutes and 7 seconds. Don't you just love a nice round number to work with? Okay, now the fun starts. Guess what we're going to use? You're right, the E6B. So on the E6B, to calculate the ground speed, we need to match up the time taken with the distance traveled. So the time taken was 14 minutes and 7 seconds, Distance travelled 26.7 nautical miles. So we're going to match these up here. So we want to spin the wheel so that the 14 minutes and 7 seconds on the inside scale is against the 26.7 nautical miles on the outside scale. And then we can read the ground speed from the time arrow here, which is showing about 114 knots. Now we need to flip over the flight computer to the wind side. 
This is a little more tricky than an all wind calculation because we'd normally start knowing what the wind is so we have to work in reverse. Let's start by setting the ground speed under the grommet that was 114 knots. I'm going to set the magnetic track of 350 degrees at the top. We know that the wind was coming from the left and we know that we were making a 5 degree correction. So our wind dot needs to go somewhere on the 5 degree line to the left. To know where on the line the dot goes, we need to know the true airspeed. Now it was bouncing around, but seemed to be oscillating around and settling on about 115 knots. So let's put the wind dot on the 115 knot line where it intersects the 5 degree line. So what we're basically doing here is recreating what would have happened in the flight planning stage but working backwards. Now if we spin the wheel so that the dot is vertically above the grommet, we can read the wind direction from the top. That's showing around 268 degrees. This would make sense so far. The wind speed can be worked out using the speed difference between the grommet and the wind dot. I'm going to slide it to the 100 speed to make it easier to read. The grommet is now on 100 and the dot is on about 111. So my calculation of the wind is 268 at 11 knots. I've now set up the same route in the G1000, which shows a wind vector on the PFD. So here we are about 7 miles from Melbourne Viawa on the same track. And you can see the wind is showing around 266 at 15 knots. I'd say that's pretty accurate given the medieval equipment that we're using. I can't imagine anyone got this far, but I'm not going to put much effort into finishing this video. So, thanks for watching.